Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter. I hope you're doing well, staying safe, and subscribing to the Kung Fu Genius channel. This episode was a lot of fun for me. I had the chance to interview my very first Sifu in Wing Chun, someone I've always affectionately called Sifu Johan. In the years before I started training in the Leung Teng Wing Chun system, I had trained in the so-called non-classical Wing Chun in the Seattle area, and I did that for a number of years under Sifu Johan. This would technically make Sifu Johan my Dai Sifu, and if you don't know what that means, check out my video on that. Since I was little, I had always wanted to study Wing Chun, but there wasn't any where I lived in New Jersey, and so I did Taekwondo instead. During high school, I lived in the Seattle area and had the chance to begin Wing Chun training at the age of 15 under Sifu Johan. The style of Wing Chun that he taught was called Chun Zhou Wing Chun, which was a non-classical adaptation of what Bruce Lee had taught his students, such as James DeMille and Ed Hart during that time in Seattle. The training I had under Sifu Johan undoubtedly influenced my very pragmatic approach to teaching Wing Chun today, and I owe a lot to him. So it was great to have the chance to chat with my old Sifu over Zoom and hear his story, reminisce about the old days, and even talk about the time he entered me into a tournament to fight a jiu-jitsu guy. Anyway, it was a great honor for me to chat to a huge inspiration of mine, Sifu Johan Sasanu. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Kung Fu genius. Sifu Johan, it's so nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Sifu Alex. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Uh, so you um, live out, so you're in the Pacific Northwest, but you don't necessarily live in a big city like Seattle. You kind of live in what we would call the sticks. Is that correct? Uh, well, I refer to it as just outside the slums of paradise. <laughs> uh, I am 20, 23 miles due east of Seattle. So, I mean, there's big city north, big city south, but to the, to the east, indeed, I live in the forest. Uh, but civilization has crept beyond us now. So, you know, towards the past, there's North Bend and Snoqualmie are becoming, you know, uh, big places these days, too. So. Uh, right. The little town you left, you know, to go go away from, uh, has uh, over forty thousand people in it now, not eight like when it was when you graduated. <laughs> incredible, incredible. Yeah, when I was there, it was relatively remote, but it's uh, it's uh, getting bigger and bigger. I remember I went to Seattle a few years ago, and I I wanted to drive to my old home in Issaquah, where I grew up, <laughs> where I went to high school, where I started training with you, and. I actually got lost up the plateau because they had like completely rearranged everything there. There's so many new developments that had grown oh, yeah. so big. It did, I, I, I didn't even know my way around there anymore. It was, it was really incredible. I was blown up. But you, oh, you live... Um, the city, Alex. Uh, the best part for me, though, is they built two brand new hospitals. So there's a brand new Swedish hospital, not even 10 minutes from my, from my door. So oh, even nice. though I live in the wilderness, I have civilization like you know, right on top of me. <laughs> got it, got it. So, so this whole quarantine thing hasn't really affected you too much. You're basically kind of living more or less in the same way as before, or? Uh, well, I don't have any, I'm not having any students coming to see me. Right. Uh, I've had, when I've taken stuff to see my mom, and she's 87, uh, she's, uh, we've been leaving things on her front door and talking to her through the window. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the grocery stores are open, you know, the, you know, I've been to a few things, but basically for the first time in, you know, like this first time in 30 years, I've actually had a month off where I just doing whatever I'm doing around the house. Right. So it's being trapped here is not, not a, uh, not a punishment. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Um, okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about your um, martial arts background. So uh, as, as I discussed at, at the beginning of the, the podcast, so you are, you're actually my first, my, my first instructor in, in the art of Wing Chun and the art of Wing Chun that you taught. You had a commercial school, the Kung Fu Club of Issaquah, which is where I started. Yes. Fulfilling one of my childhood dreams to finally learn. You know, I've been a Bruce Lee fan since I was eight. But uh, as you know, you know, it, Wing Chun is not the most accessible martial art in terms of learning. And then when I came upon your school, this was like a godsend for me. And um, can you tell the audience a little bit about your um, martial arts background and also perhaps about the specific um, version of Wing Chun that you had learned uh, so that they, they know what we're talking about here? Sure. Um, so I graduated from Redmond High School uh, back in 1975 and went to the University of Washington. 
And uh, my high school classmates uh, had started taking classes from, uh, from C. Joe James the Mile, because he had a school in Redmond back then. Uh, and uh, they were good friends of mine, and they said, oh yeah, we found the, the kind. We, this is what I need, you need to go learn this. And my college housemates, uh, uh, Child Starks and, uh, and Falcon Striker were both uh, you know, karate guys, and they'd been training with me for a while, openly mocking me about my inability to do anything martial artish. <laughs> you know, so when I became a corporate thrall for Viacom, I needed an outlet, which was uh, going to, to uh, take some Kung Fu classes. Um, and so I went to uh, uh, DeMiles School in Redmond for uh, a year, and then he moved it to Kirkland, uh, helped build the floor of his school in that place. And then I had a job in Seattle that was closer to the Green Lake School. And his student, uh, John Bial, uh, who eventually had the uh, Chun Zhou Wing Chun system, uh, had a school at Green Lake and was still part of DeMiles' system at that time. So I transferred as a blue sash to the Green Lake School. And for me, again, it was just circumstance in that my house was not 30 blocks away. Uh, so it was very, very convenient. I went to work at, uh, at on Roosevelt, 89th Roosevelt for Viacom. And on the way home, I stopped and do Kung Fu and then I get to go home. So it was the perfect arrangement. Uh, I trained there until 1993. So 12 years of training with, uh, uh, two years with Mile and 10 years with Sipo uh, 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 Bial. Um, and at some point there, uh, I, one of my biggest clients became a, an arsonist. <laughs> and I, my biggest client went away, and so I needed another job. And at the time, my super said, well, I'm going to be doing this teaching seminar. Why don't you become a kung fu teacher? And so I thought, why not? You know, So, so um, the circumstances of it was my dad uh, he wrote my dad a nice letter a couple years ago. He's passed now, but he wanted me to have my own business. And he said, whatever you want to do, uh, you can go do that. So I said, okay. And so he helped me set up that school in his squad that you were at. Uh, and in 93, we uh, hung up all those bags that they're still, I've still got those old permabilt bags, man. They're still, still, wow. still around. They actually offered to trade them out for me and give me some new ones because they've been around for 27 years, right? <laughs> um, and uh you know, put up the, the Mukjan that uh, uh, Sifu Bial had uh, built. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was teaching Kung Fu. So um, I think I've got a picture of you there someplace in your book uh, for when you were like, what, 14 or 15 years old when you walked yeah. in the front door and all that. A hundred pounds soaking wet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but what I've said about a bunch of my students is it's, uh, it's the heart, really, more than anything else. Uh, like I said, like, like your T-shirt says, from the heart, but not just your fist, your mind, right. too. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> So, so let's um, maybe um, educate the audience a little bit. Um, you know, I, I know that sometimes when we talk about the different methods of different masters, this can kind of sure. get into like some political territory, but without getting into oh, any of well, that. <laughs> yeah, anytime we talk about anything, it's going to be politics because that's the way that goes. So right. it's all going to be my opinion about this stuff. Please, sure. uh, please take a, put a big note on that. But, uh, 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 you know, uh, Cedro DeMille, the train with Bruce Lee, was one of the first five guys. You know, I got to meet uh, Jesse Glover and Ed Hart and Taki Kimura and, uh, uh, from the gang of back in the day and all that. So I, I didn't train with them, but my Sifu Bial trained with Ed Hart a bunch of, for, uh, uh, privately for quite some time. Uh, and then I got a chance from my, my, uh, the guys I mentioned earlier uh, were also into wrestling and grappling, and eventually they got into uh, – European sword fencing and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, they introduced me into a, a, a grappler who was a, a USA uh, champion at about 180, 190 pounds. And he'd also trained with Matt Hume back in the day too. And so there's a bunch of inter training and stuff like that. Even uh, one of uh, Danny and Asano's guys, uh, 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 Steve Grody was, uh, is, is kind of a cross pollinated with me because he trained with my, my friend, Dr. Tom, who's taught me all my, internal Kung Fu skills, the, uh, the Taoist practices of uh, Tao Dan Pai. So I've, I've mixed the two of them together, Alex. I've taken what those guys had as a fighting method uh, and uh, tried to keep myself healthy for another 20 years. Because uh, sure. I think when I started teaching, I was already 36, you know, uh, and I've been doing it for a long time. I, I had to do a 15 round sparring test to get my brown sash at the Green Lake School against everybody else in the school. You know, it was like one after the other, you know. Right. So um, my my friends from the Hungar school, uh, Sifu David Leong, um, 
he basically refers to them as, as live drills. And I, 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 I laugh about that because I, I never considered them as being live drills. It was just the way that we did them. <laughs> right. But as opposed to doing them without a partner, right. uh, we did everything, you know, uh, with or on someone else, you know. Right. Um, I, so, I don't think I made you do chisa with your headgear on or anything crazy like that. But that's kind of how I started back in the day was they just sort of threw us together like uh, – like uh, fighting roosters and see see what see what happens, you know. So um, you had you had mentioned that um, you know you had you had met some of these other um, people who had learned with Bruce Lee in the Seattle area. Now, obviously, for people who are uh, familiar with Bruce Lee's teachings, they 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 kind of like talk about the the pre you know like yeah they have the seattle era and then you have like the oakland era and then the los angeles era so the seattle era um not you know for i guess for for lack of a better way of describing it kind of represents his first phase teaching in the states and obviously he had already started to modify the wing chun that he had learned what um what what do you know in in terms of like you know, and again, not to like, you know, just your basic estimation. What what do you think were the main differences, for example, between someone like uh, Jesse Glover and uh, uh, James DeMille, for example? Not not necessarily just a method, but maybe like in the way they put it together or, you know, <clears throat> what would you think? When we went to that uh, that seminar up in Victoria, one of the guys said he'd done Chisa with Jesse Glover, and it was like doing Chisa with a bear. So, uh, I don't necessarily like the way they use their feet, uh, but they use chi sao as a way of uh, of sticking and trapping. But they were incredibly strong, big guys. <laughs> I mean, right. so uh, um, I teach little people and I teach big people, you know. And uh, the little people have to have more skill and more uh, understanding of the applied physics because stronger people can get away with some stuff because they're just strong. Um, so. Mm, DeMille had been a boxer for a bunch of years, and, you know, uh, Jesse was a, just a big brawler uh, as far as, uh, I think, introduction to all that stuff, and but the, uh, also judo and much of throwing things, too. So um, I think at that point, Bruce had not learned the other forms. I think they got to the Silam Tao, but I don't know at what point in his career he actually learned the Chumku and the Buji forms. So I think he was doing the best he could with what he had. And he was trying to make it work with these big guys because, I mean, they were literally, I mean, DeMille at that point, I don't think he weighed, he was boxing at, I think, 190 or 200 pounds. So, you know, he outweighed by Bruce by, what, 80 pounds or something? I mean, so, uh, you know, um, uh, they were quick, too. I mean, DeMille always had these cool toys, the speed dial thing, power thing, things that they built, hand-built testers, things to make you see how fast you were. Uh, and uh, they had a little re reaction timer with a light. So you'd see the light, and then you try to touch it, see how quick you could do it. And he said that Bruce could do it at about 16 hundredths of a second, but the mile was right there at about like 0.8 or 0.9, and the best I could ever do was like 0.22. And I I still think my, I'm faster than most of my students, even though I'm 62 at this point. You know? So I think only because I'm relaxed and don't have to worry about it anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> So um, um, what, was there a big difference between, so you had initially trained for about a, a year or so with, um, with Sifu James DeMille, and then because of convenience, you continued to train with one of his students, uh, yes. John Bial. Was there, was there a big difference in the methodology between James DeMille and, and, and John Bial, um, um, or was, or was it in the organization of it? Uh, a little bit of both. So I started with my, I still think I have here on my shelf behind me, my Wing Chun Do, uh, yeah, here it is, Green Lake Wing Chun Do notebook. Look at that, see this? Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, well, you know, I'm a pack rat, so that's how that goes. But uh, um, I went to a university where I had many students, many teachers, and they all taught me many things about different things and some things about the same. With martial arts teachers, uh, some of them believe that they know everything and that's how they're going to present it to you. And they, they give you so much that it's useless because you have more than you need. It's really the, you should have just stuck to the first page. <laughs> uh, <laughs> other people don't describe it well enough in order to be able to explain it, uh, or they wander from the path, you know, as far as all that, or they want to make it, uh, what they think is what it should be, you know? And so, um, I think that's why I end up, coming from a long line of Sijos. 
because <laughs> they all wanted to be the founding founder of the founding thing, and I just don't believe that for myself. I uh, I took what I had from what I was given, and then I, like I said, practiced live drills for a really, really long time and found that basically it works better like this and not so much like that. And you're open if your hand's here, not there. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it's, uh, I think I joke about this with you, but it's true that I taught you everything you needed to know the first day I met you. Yeah. I, you know, I, you, I, you know uh, ready stance and fighting stance and the straight punches and all that stuff. That was probably the biggest difference that I saw between, uh, sorry, between DeMille and, uh, and uh, Bial was that uh, uh, Bial ended up training with Ed Hart and ended up, uh, the Chung Choi's had been morphed into a more of a, a side punching thing because the Mao was a boxer and he liked that better for his power line theory. Uh, but you couldn't track an evasive opponent as well with those punches because you had, you know, a sideways uh, inertia. And so the regular straight punches I find to be much more efficient and, and, and faster in a bunch of things. So, uh, so that got blended back, you know, so um, the, uh, that's probably the biggest difference that I saw between the two systems. Yeah, that's interesting. Also, one of the things I remark and I've, I've taken into my own teaching career, which is uh, definitely from your influence as well, is one of the things that impressed me the most with your school was when I joined, Yeah, I, I, you gave us all this three ring binder, which had our program, what we had to learn. It was very, very clear. And you had like regular reviews to make sure that the students were learning and advancing. And that I've rarely seen in, in any martial arts school, regardless of the style. And that is something that I've actually gone on to uh, incorporate into my school. As a matter of fact, I have I also have an example here. I created, yeah, I created workbooks for all my students for all the different programs with everything that they need to know and charts and, you know, all the stuff that they need to know. And this is 100% from, from the influence that I got from you. I thought there had never been a more organized way of teaching. And I think some people like to learn by doing and some people like to learn by seeing, but to give the students all the tools for them to become successful, I think is really great. And that's something that I really appreciated uh, when I learned from you. Now, uh, who it's was- a matter, who, yeah. Let me make a point there first, if I can, Alex. Um, it's a point of honesty. If I write down what it is I'm teaching you, and then you say, is that what I'm teaching you? Then I can say, yeah. And if you don't explain, understand what it is, I can try to explain it to you. But if I don't write it down, then maybe I tell you one thing and the other guy something else. And yes. you should stand with your knees in and you should stand with your hands behind your back. <laughs> you, know, right. so, uh, you know, so uh, um, having uh, that way, we the hardest problem we have with human beings, period, is being able to communicate. And so when I say something, I have people that don't speak English as a first language and stuff. And so it, I... It, I can see how they become confused because I have to use the words I have that they don't understand in order to say what I'm doing. So I can show them better than I can say it sometimes. But the being understand what it is written is probably very important because you know then you've got all those parts and pieces. Yeah, so. absolutely. And and I think that that uh, what you mentioned there about about the honesty I think is important because uh, you know many at least in Wing Chun I think many instructors they don't want to write down their syllabus one because it's a lot of work it's not an easy task to do it um right. and and second i think it, well it, it holds you accountable as the instructor if you say you need to know these 10 things your student's right. been with you for a few years and say see well i never learned these two things you can't just go uh don't worry like once it's written down now that there's yeah. a certain right. level of of uh open and and, and uh, transparency i should say that needs to be there so that's a really good um really good point that you made um was that was that Sifu John Bial's influence? Was that his idea to kind of write everything down, or did you guys have that from? Oh, De De Demile had gave us the notebooks. I mean, that was uh -huh. the original thing. So that's what they got that back then. Uh, I, my understanding was that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Sifu Bial had met uh, uh, Sifu Demile uh, down in Sebastopol, uh, California, when he was down there, and. Uh, he had moved to Cedar Woolley, Washington, and so he followed him up for the six-month immersion thing that Demal used to do with his his guys, and that's how I. F Oops, sorry. sorry you, 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 muted, you muted yourself there for a moment. So you yeah, so about the immersion, yeah, that, that's where we left off. The uh, uh, um. John Bial had gone for that immersion training. That, that's what you had. Yeah, they, so up in Cedar Woolley, Washington, which is about 60 miles north of here, the mile had a big uh, camp. And so he had eight or 10 guys, uh, you know, training together. 
uh, and you would train Kung Fu every day, every day, every day for six months, and then you'd get your teaching certificate. And so there was a guy that had a school, I think, eventually up in, up in Canada and Ontario, and a couple other people, uh, Lou Kamon, that's on the cover of some of the Miles old uh, Wing Chun Do books, and a couple of the guys that, you know, part of that system and stuff, you know. Right, so, right. Um, so that's when John opened his school at Green Lake. Uh, was just about that time, about a year after I started training with the Miles. So it all, not unlike your own impeccable timing, uh, if you were a little older, you wouldn't have been at my school because I opened it in 93. And if you were any younger, you know, something else might have happened. You know, I mean, right. who, you know, I mean, you know, so because uh, uh, if you were younger, you might not have come back from Germany and been in New York City at the perfect moment. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, so you, what you learn from me more than anything is what we call impeccable Taoist timing. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's not important to be uh, good because that takes practice. It's better to be lucky. <laughs> um, uh, so another thing you had mentioned uh, briefly, which I thought was interesting about uh, that uh, Sifu James to Miles influence of boxing had caused him to do uh, the chung choys or the chain punches, essentially more parallel rather than kind of coming down the middle, but that Ed Hart still did it in, in a more centralized way or, or um, yes, yes. And, and, and so what was that? Um, Cause I'm also very curious because of, of all the instructors that like we have some video footage of uh, Jesse Glover doing his thing, you know, hitting like a mule. We obviously have some, you know, uh, lots of, we have lots more access to some of the other students, but Ed Hart, um, who I always find really interesting because he always just looked like such a pleasant kind of cool guy from all the photos. We don't really have like, like I'm very curious what Ed Hart's skill set was like, what his emphasis was like. Is Can you give any kind of idea in terms of like, um, because sure. he was a very he was a very skinny guy. He wasn't like a power dude like 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 James DeMille. Oh, he was he'd been a he been a bouncer most of his life, mm -hmm. you know. So he spent a bunch of time doing uh, uh, bar submission kinds of thug thing, you know, come alongs and that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, the, the story, the anecdotal stories I had from my own teacher, and these are of course you know uh, uh, hearsay, but the, that's the best I can do for you. Uh, would be that. Uh, that he would train with them and Ed would be in his underwear smoking a cigarette, basically, you know, <laughs> and he would just beat him around the room in his underwear uh, and, uh, and, you know, doing chi sao or doing the punches or doing whatever. And, and that's also how he got introduced to the ground fighting stuff. And because of that, that's uh, uh, Sipu Bial ended up training with Matt Hume. And that's how I got cross pollinated because Matt Hume's old training buddy was Al Kinney Nimrod, my friend from the, that was a, my karate guy. They were firefighters together at SeaTac. So eventually you have this whole thing all mixed together. Um, not unlike the other day, I'd gone to Mop uh, Phi, had his 50th anniversary of teaching Kung Fu. He had a big, huge uh, uh, dinner, and we got to get to do a little uh, a Wing Chun demonstration in front of all these Hungar guys. It was great. Um, but uh, one, of his, one of the students came in at me afterwards and asked me, do you, did you teach uh, um, Jesse Chester? And I go, yeah, yeah, I taught Jesse. And he goes, uh, Jesse and I used to train back in, in high school at Issaquah High School. Jesse used to beat me up all the time. You, you were his teacher. You know, you know, so, so anyway, so uh, it's funny because 20 years later to hear those stories makes me realize that the influence was more than I appreciated at the time, I guess. Sure, sure. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, that's the thing about teaching is you don't realize the, the, the broadness of, of the influence until much, much later. But I mean, yeah, I mean, for... For me, uh, being able to train Wing Chun at your school was was huge. And I remember the moment I could start doing that, you know, I would come as often as I could and I would be training there and I would bring my family and bring friends. And it was it was it was such a big deal for me. And especially high school, is such a weird time for anyone. I mean, I like and, and so for me, I, 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 I spent most of my day in high school waiting for the time I could go to Kung Fu class in the evening. And, and that was, was such a lifesaver for me because as someone who grew up, I grew up here in the East Coast. So I'm, I, I'm kind of a Jersey, New York person at heart. And I, I always felt a little bit like a fish out of water in, in the Pacific Northwest, as beautiful as it is. I just was very different from the people that live there. But your school was such a huge, I mean, it's probably one of the things that really got me through that very weird time in a, in a young man's life. And, and you know, I, I think... There's no way for me to adequately express that in words to you, except for the way I just tried to tell you now. But it was huge, and I think that I think a lot of people had a similar experience too. So, 
Uh, yes. On the on the wall over here, it says uh -huh. uh, some some people seek atmosphere, others create it. Ah, uh, yes, yes, correct, correct. So, um, so, so you you've done me the greatest kindness by mimicking my all the bags and the stuff. I think you've even got one of the mukjans there from one of my students. Yes, the, yes, up, yes. <laughs> on the wall too, right? You know, so it's uh, we, uh, all. Uh, my dad paid it for, and that's what I was been telling you before. Was that he he was such a generous man. He wanted and gregarious that he wanted people to be successful and uh, and uh, uh, joyful in their pursuit. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think I think if people had seen your school, the old Kung Fu Club of Issaquah, and then came into my school today, they would see clearly your influence is there. Students come, they they get like they get the handbook, they get the uniform, they get all that kind of stuff. You go upstairs, we have the row of the heavy bags, we have like the wooden dummies, the wall bags, and 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 that kind of having that kind of modern um, feel to an old style Kung Fu school, I think is definitely, definitely very present there. Um, so I also uh, wanted to discuss, because you had mentioned briefly that, um, uh, that uh, about the training, the cross training between um, John Biol and Matt Hume, and then you with also one of Matt Hume's training partners, uh, is that right. my, my first exposure to, to grappling, um, yeah, uh, serious, <laughs> serious the, grappling. Did you get the tournament? Well, actually, well, first, the one at first, the Miles School. Yes. Well, first <laughs> it was first it was at your school. You had taught some uh, grapple, which I really thought was great. Is like you have the normal Wing Chun curriculum, and then you also had like weapons training so that the students can get some competency in weapons and some grappling training so that they can do that. And these were like things that would enhance your ability in the standard kung fu, so to speak. So um, I, you know, my first. Well, I'd, I actually, uh, my first training in, in grappling was when I was a child, uh, when I was about 10 years old here uh, on the East Coast. My karate instructor was actually one of the first students of the Gracies on the East Coast. He was flying to California to learn from uh, Hoist and Horian before the UFC. And I remember he would come back and he would show us like, you know, like mount escape or how to get up off the ground. He's like, this is called Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And I, I had no idea how that was different from anything else. So I had learned like two moves and then never thought about it until right. in the 90s. And when UFC and grappling became a big thing. And then you, of like a Wing Chun instructor, had a grappling class, which you would teach period. Like you would do like a four or six week grappling course, I remember. Right. And then I had, I had done one of those. So I think I learned like a couple of basic escapes and maybe an arm lock. And then you asked me if I wanted to do uh, that grappling tournament. I think you asked, I think the grappling tournament was on Saturday and you asked me on Monday. <laughs> there you go. Well, and I you was know. like, sure, no problem. I'll do it. Right. <laughs> now, I think I fought Ken DeMille that night though. I think that yeah, was my, my big, yeah, yeah. So that was uh, another one of those things where you, uh, if I were to do it again, I would do it differently. But my friend, uh, Al Kenny Nimrod, Nimrod, my uh, training partner, the one that trained with Matt Hume, um, he weighed 310 pounds when I trained with him. And so when I went back to be tested by my seafood to see how my ground fighting skills were, when I bridged him off, he did not weigh 310 pounds. He only weighed 220 pounds. So I <laughs> launched him over my head because I was used to having to bench press 310 live pounds. So, sure. uh, and uh, I lost, the best thing I ever learned from Nimrod was basically his irrepressible dialogue while he was beating you. He would grind you as a person, not only uh, physically, but verbally. It was continually just <laughs> chat in your ear and it was just brutal while you're grappling with it because he just wouldn't shut up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I, I teach my students these skills as well because if you can get inside your opponent's head, then they're, uh, I, I watched the uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, uh, George, For George Foreman fight the other day and he was doing oh, that the yeah. whole fight, man. He was just chatting in his ear, just talking, the whole talking, time, talking. Yeah. Classic, classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I actually still have oh, uh, the trophy um, from, from that James DeMau tournament here that oh, I got. Oh, sweet. There you go. Right on, man. There you go. That's classic. And That's for me, great. that was that Oh, was a, uh, a shout out yeah. to, to, uh, to see Joe uh, 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 DeMau, by the way. He just had uh, uh, some surgery back in Hawaii, uh, and uh, hopefully he's, he's healing and doing better and stuff. He's, I think he's 82 these days. And, wow. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the old, uh, the old uh, dragons are, you know, they're not going to be around for much, much longer. Yeah, you know unfortunately, I mean? unfortunately. So. That was a huge day for me because, uh, you know, uh, with, with very little notice and almost no specific preparation, I decided like, yeah, sure, I'll fight this <laughs> jujitsu tournament. And when we got there, there weren't like enough fighters to justify all the weight classes. So I remember they right, yeah some brown belt who like outweighed me by 40 pounds or something. And yeah, I was like, right, right. 
I was like, oh, I mean, I was still, I was 18 or 19 at the time, but I still, I still look like a child. I wasn't like an imposing 18 year old. And this guy was, he was like a grown guy. And I remember, uh, you know, I had, <laughs> I, I felt a lot of pressure because uh, Sifu John Bial had come and that was, I think the first right, right. time I had ever met him. And suddenly the first time I'm going to see him, he's like going to watch me fight. And so I felt like I had to represent you because I'm like kind of his grand student through Issaquah. Right, then you were sure. there. And then, yeah, yeah. and then see what James DeMille was there, the student of Bruce Lee. And here I am, the Wing Chun guy, and I have to fight the jujitsu guy. And I just remember feeling so much pressure in that moment that I'm like, I cannot lose this fight. And I beat the jujitsu guy, which for me was so, because that was the first guy I fought. I beat the jujitsu guy and I was so exhausted I lost the second. I lost the second fight, but the second fight was against one of James DeMille's guys, who was a Wing Chun guy. And I always go, I don't care that I lost to the Wing Chun guy, as long as I beat the right. Jiu Jitsu guy, I was happy, right? <laughs> there and, you go. And, and James DeMille came up after me after my fight, and and um and he sat down with me. And then there was one other student of yours, blonde haired kid that uh, had also fought. Yeah, in the I think it's, I think Sean. I think Sean, his name was Sean. I think. Yes, I think so too. Head. And he sat us both yep. down and James DeMille talked to us a little bit about his training with Bruce Lee and what he called Bruce Lee's toolkit. And that was such a huge thing for me. And I felt so happy that I was able to like defeat the jujitsu guy in front of, you know, one of Bruce Lee's students. And I didn't even care about losing that one fight to the Wing Chun guy. I was like, whatever, that's fine. <laughs> I'm totally cool with well, that. <laughs> well, for, for myself, I, I couldn't imagine what I was going to do for the 30 seconds with, with Kenny. Because, like right. I said, he weighed 290 pounds, and he had, you know, arms twice as big as mine. You know, as right. as but what was funny, because I watched the tape over and over again afterwards, I hit him in the chest seven or eight times. You couldn't punch to the face in the tournament. Yes, I hit yes. him in the chest seven times. But I, I hit him like, a, like, a, uh, like I was turning with one of my students, like I, I was taking coup. So, I mean, if you watch the tape, I hit him seven or eight times. If I'd actually hit him, he would have been out. But I didn't actually hit him, and so he grabbed me and went up on the floor and all that and everything. Uh, and I remember uh, my adrenaline kicked in so hard the second round that I was trying to get behind him to choke him because I was quicker than he was. But it seemed like it was taking forever because, you know, I was like my brain was working four times faster than normal. And just, you know. So anyway, it was uh, one of those moments in my, in my life where I go, yeah, this is fun. But, you know, I – the adrenaline wore off in three hours and my whole body hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, but yeah. I got, I got, I got him in a, in a, in a headlock and he called me the next day and goes, man, my neck is just killing me today. And I go, yeah, yeah, well, good, good. <laughs> we're, we're we have the, we share the Shane birthday. He, he his birthday is also November the 14th. He's buddy. I think he's about maybe eight or 10 years younger than I am. Yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so after, after a few years, uh, so you started your school in 93, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay, and then you taught in Issaquah, like at, let's say, at, at a commercial location until, uh, until when? I got divorced in 2007. And so I converted the Kung Fu Club wisely into a sports bar. And so I could be an evil landlord, and I moved the whole Kung Fu caboodle here to the riverside in Fall City, uh, next to the Raging River, the Xiangjiang River. Uh, and I have a yurt, it's like a Mongol. It's a uh, three, you know, seven. It's almost as big as the school was. It's 800 square feet inside the yurt. Plus I've got a room full of mukjans, and I've got a tower with all my bags, and I've got a space outside by the river. I even make my students train in the river because in the summertime we can go down there, and you really have to practice good footwork there because that's you know. Uh, you can't step where you think you want to. Right. 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 <laughs> Great. So you uh, still have, so you so yeah. you still actively so, teaching then, or do you do you like personally select students now, or do you have like a website, or like how do people find you if they want to train with you, or is that or is that window closed? Hold on. I think you've muted yourself again. <laughs> Hold on. Give me a sec here. There we go. Okay, I unmuted you. You, I think you muted yourself good. by accident. Yeah, yeah. But, so. No, I did. I did. I tried to turn it off, and it went on again. So I don't know what's going on with that. Um, no, I have. Uh, I, I. So the irony would be, I moved my school in 2008 when the recession hit. So I couldn't tell whether it was the recession that was killing me, or whether it was just, um, you know, the move. Uh, I, I had a little girl that trained with me named still trains with me. Her name's Christine. She started when she was six. She's 26 now. So she's trained with me for like 20 years. 
So her and her brother all trained with me since they were little kids all the way to their adults. Uh, uh, I've got little people that keep showing up. I have more younger students now than you older students, but I'm close enough to, you know, Amazon and uh, Costco and Microsoft and all those things. Most of my guys are techies. Oh, you'll like this, Alex. Um, Josh Russell used to train with Josh about the same time as you did. He's mm -hmm. now working for 342 where they build the Halo game. Oh, wow. Uh, and if you didn't know, Eric Nyland, one of my students, wrote the Halo book, The Fall of Reach. So if you ever read that book, it's got a bunch of kung fu in it. They slap block missiles and they shrimp behind people and choke them out. There's a, a gong in the school. There's a guy with a long mustache that's the, the king of the, of the spaceship and all that. So uh, the, one of my students wrote the book. One of my students is making the game. And one of my guys that's a coder is actually writing the code for the game. So, uh, uh, I, I, I laugh again about the, 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 the Tao of pay of being small or virtuous. Uh, by doing nothing, I've become what I am, I guess. So I, I, <laughs> I have students, all the new students all the time. I don't know how they find me. I have a web page up. I've got uh, ads in the paper. I do Qigong classes for little old ladies at uh, Providence Marionwood. I had a 102-year-old student for a few years. I was. Wow. Great. I go to school in the morning, and I teach little people who are six. And then later in the day, I have some lady that was 102. You know? Wow. So, um, um, I, and then sometimes I teach the little old ladies, uh, the Wing Chun too, just the hand movements and the names and stuff. Cause sure, you, know, sure, they, sure. You, know, you, know, you don't need little old ladies in wheelchairs running around doing Wing Chun on each other. <laughs> so wrong. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, and then, uh, a, a couple years ago, one of my students here in town, um, here in Falls City is not really a town. It's an unincorporated sub area, but we won't get into the details of that. Uh, we have a derby, uh, a, a duck derby every year, and they had a giant duck dragon that they had. And um, they asked the Kung Fu Club to take the duck dragon out for one last run for the parade. And so I got my friends from the Hungar School to come up with their Chinese lions and everything. So we won the parade, and they gave us the first prize and all that good stuff. So I bought myself a Chinese dragon, 25-foot blue dragon. Um, and so ever since then, Sipu Bao Leong and I have been doing a bunch of stuff in Chinatown, Seattle, and we've got a chance to do all the New Year's stuff at some of the nursing homes and the casinos. And I got to see parts of Chinatown in Seattle that you wouldn't normally get to see because I get to go up on the second floor where, the, where they're still playing mahjong and smoking cigarettes like the old days, even though it says no smoking on every post, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's fun because... Uh, um, I got to meet his dad, and I, I don't know if you've ever been to a Chinese lion funeral, but I've unfortunately been to two in the last year as both his mother and his father passed away, Sifu Leon's uh, family. Uh, but I've known those guys now for 15 or 20 years because they came to Issaquah to do a, a demonstration, but they didn't have enough people to do it, so they asked us to help them, and so we've been friends ever since. Wow. So just like yourself, you, once, you, once you help some Kung Fu friends, they're more than willing to bring you things or do whatever you need in order to you know, make it all work. You know, so. Right, right. You, you also had mentioned that at some point you started to integrate some Qigong training, especially as you started to feel that this was kind of the thing that was maybe missing from kind of the more practical and aggressive uh, style of Wing Chun you had been doing. And so how did you come into learning um, the Qigong that you learned and also what... Um, yeah. What is the style of Qigong that you do? Yes. Um, I had this argument with my friend. Uh, uh, he's a, a Sifu because uh, he's a teacher. He's also a captain, ex-captain in the Marines, but he's also a professor of osteopathic medicine, uh, Thomas McCombs. Mm -hmm. He lived in Issaquah up in Klahani uh, back in the day, and he had a practice down there by the 76 station right there by the freeway. Uh, and he walked into my school maybe six months after I started teaching. And he asked me the most important question, and uh, he said uh, uh, he, he was an open pro because he doesn't really get along with people who are too Christian. And so he asked me what my religion was, and I considered myself a born-again pagan at that time. And so he <laughs> said, oh, perfect. And so we became, we became good friends. And every Monday for the next eight years, he would come to my house or I'd go to his, and he, I taught him how to do the sticking hands and the the chi sao training and stuff. Uh, and he taught me the, the Dao Dan Pai, the internal elixir style of, uh, of, of, of uh, internal Kung Fu, of Nei Gong or Qi Gong. Mm -hmm. uh, the same schools that teach in, uh, at the North Hollywood Taoist uh, uh, Center uh, with uh, uh, Sifu uh, Totten and then uh, uh, Sifu Helms down in San Diego. And there's also a couple of schools in uh, uh, 
Uh, well, the best one is Billy Woods. He's a drummer. He just travels all over the world drumming and teaching Qigong. So I, uh, so I'd hurt my shoulder doing the hard method of the, the of, with Sifu Bial. And the stuff that I learned from Tom, not only the liniments and the tonics and a bunch of stuff, but a bunch of exercises to rehab my shoulder and my back. And uh, I had hurt my groin uh, a long time ago. And I, I, I was able to resolve all those issues by uh, daily diligent practice. <laughs> you know, so uh, 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 the footwork is this, ends up being more or less the same. I mean, the, the stuff that they taught the emperor, he was already a great fighter. Like the Emperor Chao from the beginning of the Song Dynasty, about 950 AD, he, he, he had the misfortune of winning. And then he had to basically sit behind a throne and push papers the rest of his life. So his wise Taoist abbot, rather than come live with him, taught him some exercises he could do for half an hour every day so that he could stay powerful and, uh, and healthy. Got it, got it. So, yeah, I think that at some point in, in everyone's martial arts career, especially if they come from a martial art that emphasizes practical fighting and sparring and all this kind of stuff. At some point, it, it's a must that you also have to find some kind of balance to it. Some martial arts might have that more integrated, but um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, at some point it, it's, as, as I get older now, I, you know, I start to, yeah, because I remember when I was learning from you as a teenager and you would talk about the Qigong stuff, I had like zero interest in it because I'm like, I just want to keep learning to fight. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, but that's exactly it though, Alex. But eventually the thing that you learn from fighting is your present moment skills. Yes. So you take that present moment skills to your seated practice or to your Qigong practice, and you already know how to concentrate and to focus and to be in the present moment for where, how long ever it takes, you know? Because if I was punching you in the head and you weren't paying attention, you would be getting punched in the head. <laughs> you know, so, so no, no, but so, so that's what I'm saying. So those great warriors often become poets or uh, storytellers or whatever, because like I sent you that poem yesterday, we see things, you know, we yeah. parse things with detail. Because I, you, you know, you look at your students and you can see the, the little mistakes or the little things that they're doing. Uh, and you, can, you know, you run the tape back in your head and go, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But paying attention to detail, being in the moment, these kind of things. And yeah, as I get older, you know, I'm, I'm 42 now. Um, so which is crazy because uh, of, of all like the mentors and teachers I've had in my life, you're, you're one of the ones I've had the perhaps the longest relationship with. So it's interesting to see, you know, when I look at the photo uh, that you sent me when I started at your school, I mean, at that time I looked like a child, but you also look very different too. So it's interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've got, I've got white eyebrows. Soon I'll be white eyebrow school. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You, the, the legit like a, mark. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the legit mark of an old Kung Fu master are those, those old long white eyebrows, right? Oh no, it's, it's, it's the knuckles on your fist, man. Just yes. Like those bad boys. Yeah. Yes. For, 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 for wing some people for sure. For sure. Uh, uh, you know, but more importantly, I play the piano all the time. So in order to rehab my fingers, I, I move, make small movements. Though yes. Dr. Tom would, would testify that I left my five fingerprints on his leg once because he showed me. Because the, the doctor had a, has a, 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 basically a, a, a tumor in his, in his skull. So I could never hit him in the head because his, uh -huh. his head was so thin there that uh if i touched him there i could kill him okay so i trained with him trained chi sao and a bunch of stuff with him for for 10 years and never hit him in the head uh but one time i hit him in the leg <laughs> so when i hit him with the leg i've been playing the piano since i was two and so i've been hitting ivory with my fingertips just like i've been beating on mukdong for you know 30 years my fingertips can you know leave little dents on you too so um but i don't i don't think of that way i just because i I prefer to make beautiful sounds rather than leave bruises. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I remember that that's actually something you have been saying for the longest time. I didn't appreciate it as a teenager, but I remember you talking about, you know, that you, you know, you can still punch and transfer all this power, but you can also still play piano. And, and right. I remember you would say that. And I thought like, you know, I mean, yeah, that's a good thing, but I, I wasn't as seasoned with dealing with like lots of kind of macho tough guy, martial arts as I martial art guys as I am now. And having met, you know, some of my friends, whether they're from Chinese or Japanese martial arts, who has essentially spent, you know, 20, 30 years mutilating the hell out of their knuckles and their wrists and have all sorts of 
problems and arthritis and can't move their hand and can't, can't punch, uh, can't, cannot punch anymore because they've essentially ruined their hand and also don't have the dexterity to do other things that, you know, as I started to get older and I would also do a lot of wall bag punching or heavy bag punching, but to make sure that, you know, the digits can still move and stretch it out and make sure that I can still, you know, t type, type on my computer and that I'm, you know, that the martial practice isn't ruining, you know, kind of the normal everyday things that you want to be able to do. And that was also something that definitely, definitely learned um, perhaps a bit later, but the seed had been planted from, from what you had said about, I can punch someone with my body weight, but I can still play piano. And it taking a number of years for me to realize how, how kind of unique that is among, among um, martial artists. Yeah. yeah. Indeed, cool. my friend. Cool. Yeah. Well, hey, this was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so yeah. much for taking the time to talk to me. Well, I hope you're, that you're, yeah, you're, you're welcome. If you've got another 500 questions, you know, uh, you know, please, please ask. Uh, the uh, the most important thing I learned from my Taoist studies was a, one of the old teachers told me that I should keep a smile in my heart. Yeah, and uh, I I definitely believe that, uh, and I also believe from my own my own grandmother, my dad's mom, that you should also keep a twinkle in your eye, because being a little mischievous and kind of a little goofy makes life go much easier because uh, you can uh, you approach it with a sense of humor and then you'll be okay. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Steve Johan, for taking the time. I look forward right. to doing this again and I hope our listeners definitely appreciate this uh, rare insight uh, into, you know, someone who, in my opinion, unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about you. I think more people should know about you. I think what you've done is great and your influence on me is uh, undeniable, but you're much greater more than just your influence on me. Uh, and I thank you for that.